Good to see you all. Uh, welcome to our first official uh, semesterly material text roadshow, following on our unofficial um, trial run of it last May. We do expect this to be a, a, a one-time event per semester. And the idea behind this event is that even after we're able to meet in person again on the sixth floor of the library, we, we like this format of a lightning round Zoom event uh, featuring several speakers who might be further away from Philadelphia than would otherwise make it possible for them to speak at the workshop. And we were trying to put together speakers from diverse disciplines and periods around a common theme to see what connections emerge. And our theme this uh, time is writing on objects. So how, do, how does our work on material text, which has often been defined around books and manuscripts primarily, change when we're dealing with material culture and artifacts that are not always housed in a rare books library? I'm gonna introduce all our speakers uh, up front and uh, just very briefly, then they'll each uh, take their uh, turn at the, um, at the PowerPoint basically. And then at the end of all four, we'll have our question and discussion period where as usual, you can use the raise hand, the raise hand function. You can also use the chat. Um, and uh, I expect we'll have a lively conversation. So I'll just introduce them in alphabetical order, which is the way in which we'll proceed, um, I think. Uh, Christopher Faraone is professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Chicago. He's the author of Vanishing Acts, Delettio Morbi as Speech Act and Visual Design on Ancient Greek Amulets in 2012, The Stanzaic Architecture of Archaic Greek Elegy, 2008, and his most recent book is The Transformation of Greek Amulets in Roman Imperial Times, 2019. Suzanne Carr Schmidt is the curator of rare books and manuscripts at the Newberry Library. She was um, previously assistant curator in the Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago. She has a PhD in the history of art from Yale University where she wrote on the Renaissance pop-up book. And she writes about interactive and material aspects of pre-modern printmaking. Shannon Mattern is professor of anthropology at the New School for Social Research. She's the author of the new downtown library, Designing with Communities, Deep Mapping the Media City, and Code and Clay, Data and Dirt. And her new book is forthcoming from Princeton, The City is Not a Computer. Jennifer Park is assistant professor of English at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, where she specializes in early modern literature. And she's currently working on two book length projects, one on recipes, science and race, and race in early modern drama, and one on race making in the material textual cultures of games and science in 17th century England. So um, we will start with Chris um, on amulets. Take it away. Okay, so uh, Phil, yeah, can you put my PowerPoint up there? Okay, hi everybody. Uh, this is gonna be a little awkward. If I have to tell Phil when to change, change the slide. So he's controlling the, the machine as it were. Um, a little bit of background. This is a, um, a bronze, uh, as you can see, plaque. Uh, it's in the shape of an idiculum. Uh, it's about the size of a playing card. Um, it it uh, was found in Egypt in the end of the 19th century. Um, it's dated to the 8th or 9th century, mainly because it has an Arabic inscription on it that I'll show you in, in a bit. Um, it's inscribed on both sides, and you can see that um, it has a perforation in the top. We think it was hung against a wall, and the, uh, the, the, the side B, which is the side on your right, uh, is worn away a little bit, so it seems like it's scraped against the wall a little bit. Um, but it's very thick. It, 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 it's impossible to, to uh, it's very stiff. I, I spent a lot of time with this object. Um, what interests me is it contains, uh, so uh, go, go ahead, Phil. Next one. All right, so this is what, yeah, I just wanted you to see, see the drawing of it so you can get, get that in your mind. Most of the PowerPoint, I'll show you the, show you the photograph, but it has um, 
six uh, uh, drawings or uh, in, uh, inscriptions, images, uh, and about five of them are surrounded by text. And that's, that's the text that I'm most interested in. Why does the text go around it? You can see in the upper left corner of the, the uh, side on the left, uh, the Arabic inscription, which I will say I, I, I've sent to many Arabists and no one's been able to really translate it. Okay, that doesn't, have, it, it looks like it might be uh, uh, Arab, Arab, Arabizing something, but it's, uh, if any of you uh, have a talent in here, I would love to know if you have any idea what that uh, inscription means. Um, the, um, When it was first found, people thought it was a composite amulet. So they thought that it was um, designed to protect a, a place. So it was hung up in a house, right? The problem is that, um, is that four of the six images we know from Roman period uh, amulets were used to protect, uh, we were used to heal diseases, eye disease or stomach disease, all right? Um, so I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago uh, proposing that it's actually a kind of a handbook. It's a kind of a pattern book for originally uh, some forlager of this uh, um, plaque was created in the Roman period and it was used for gem cutters to know how to design their gems. But it was copied over at least once and probably more than once. Um, and and the, the, uh, the relationship between the, the writing to the images um, is important. In most cases, it seems that the text that on the plaque that goes around the, um, uh, the image uh, on the gem was found on, 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 uh, uh, on the backside of the gem. So I'll just show you some examples. So, so Phil, go ahead. All right, so the, the, keep going. There's the inscription, keep going. All right, so this here, image here is a, a, an aerial vision, uh, aerial view of a, a lizard. Um, and it's found on, uh, there's about uh, two dozen gemstones that have this image. And it, we know from the literary text that it was used to heal eye disease. All right, so you can go to the next. So here you can see, this is the obverse of these gems. It has a lizard uh, in the middle. It has a crescent moon over its head. And it has, um, go to the next one, Phil. Uh, it has, uh, a Greek letter pi and a Greek letter eta on either side of its head. And then go to the next slide, Phil. And then it has a rho and an alpha. So this is, and you can see that the, this, this much later plaque, they don't quite get the, the, the letters right. So the, the pi looks more like an omega, the eta looks like a nu and so on and so forth. They, they get the idea that you have to have them in, in the four places, but they don't really understand what they're copying. Go to the next slide, Phil. And on the backs of these gems, uh, they, every one of these gems has the same inscription. It says, Kante Sule, we don't really know what it means, right? But on the, uh, the, the, um, the bronze tablet, you can see where that blue arrow is. You see a kappa and a delta, which should be an alpha, but basically uh, it's, it's the same word that's been poorly uh, transmitted. So go to the next slide, Phil. You can see, uh, uh, hmm. okay, go back then. Uh, uh, go, go forward one. So, uh, so the, the inscription that should be on the back of the gem has been inscribed on the, on the right side of the lizard. Everything else the, has been added so sometime in, in the copying of this handbook. Uh, and none of this makes any sense. And some of uh, it's, uh, it, there's no parallel at all among the, the several thousand uh, uh, Greek amulets that we have. So go to the next slide, Phil. Uh, th th this is the second, where the blue arrow is, this is the second of uh, 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 image we're gonna look at. Uh, go next slide, please. So on your right, you see a, a standard image of this, uh, snake with a lion head and a radiant crown. It's called Knubis, that's, uh, that's the name that's on the back of them. And you can, you can barely see, this is, a, this is a very bad rendition of it on the plaque. Um, you, but the key thing to notice is the loop in the tail, okay? This, this Knubis snake always has a loop in its tail and it always has a profile head. Uh, go to the next slide, Phil. Uh, and it's hard to see because this, this is uh, it's somewhat worn, but the, 
beginning with the blue arrow on the right, the name Knubis is there, and then there are three X's. All right, go to the next slide, Phil. And on the backs of, so we have um, several, well, let me think. We have a, about 150 of these gems and they're almost all of them <clears throat> have this name Knubis or Knumis on the back. And they have these three Z, Zs with a line going through them, right? On the, the copper plaque has, instead of having a, a new, it has uh, Kai and Pi, and then it's followed by three Xs. And I think this is, uh, what the scribe, uh, what if, if, after it was copied over more than once, uh, we ended up with this uh, rendition of it. Uh, go to the next slide, Phil. All right, and um, so and basically, uh, let me just say for, for that that uh, the Knubis gems are used to heal stomach aches uh, and intestinal problems. All right, uh, the the text that goes, and it, it, the, same, the same pattern follows. The text to the right of the Knubis is what we find on the, uh, on the, on the back side of, a ge of many gems. The text to the left side is completely made up. It seems as if um, at, at some point in this transmission, the scribe felt that the, the, scribe felt that, that the, the text had, had to completely encircle the gem. So again, this is just completely made up. Uh, um, it has, has Greek letters and it has a couple of um, uh, symbols that are used um, in measurements. It has nothing to do with, uh, with the amulet. And I'll just quickly go through the third one. Uh, go ahead, Phil. Uh, and this one here, you have the same snake. Uh, here you can see better what the, what the lion head looks like. Just stay there for a second. Uh, um, the, and it has a text that goes around it and it's hard to see, but the text is broken up. In, in the text on the gem, this is a gem in Paris. The text on the gem is broken in, into four in four places, so it's it's four words, right? Uh, and you can see on the on the plaque, it's again, it's it's uh, not a very good version of it, but, but you can see, you can see the the altar or the pillar that it's on, and you can see it's a profile. So go to the next slide, Phil. Um, so this is what this is what the uh, you can see what the text is around the edge of the gem in Paris. It's Knubis, Knufifi, Murai, and so on and so forth. Go to the next slide. Um, this inscription it doesn't appear. It's not around the it's not around the image on the plaque, but it appears below. Uh, and then go to the next slide, Phil, so we can quickly just see a comparison. So. The, the copper plaque, the text is on the bottom, and it's uh, it's basically the same except for some sp some spelling errors uh, that are common in this in this period. So again, this plaque, which which is about five or six hundred years old, older than the gems, uh, right, has preserved the inscription uh, and and to some degree has in very schematic form has preserved um, the uh, the image go keep, go go again Phil I think we're we're I think we're done so just to give you an idea um, of the, the general picture and um, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, what happens the project I'm working on now is I'm interested in in uh, magical handbooks and how they transmit images right and how they tell us where to put the, the text that go with them right and there's a shift in the fourth, in the late third century and fourth century CE, when the, the very complicated science of engraving gems disappears, it, to engrave a gem, you had to, you had to have a certain a certain kind of wheel. You had to have access to the gemstones, and the gem cutters were uh, were highly trained individuals. Um, they seem to, uh, uh, at least uh, the, for the for, for the the sorcerers and the magicians who made these amulets. Uh, uh, they switched, it's very clear, from cutting gems to putting the same images in text on papyrus, on gold and silver foil, and then very much, and then go to the next slide. Uh, and in the early Byzantine period, they actually began to do this on bronze amulets that are flat. Uh, and they, you can see they have the same uh, system of an image in the middle and a text that goes all the way around it. So part of my thesis is that um, th these uh, gem handbooks were kind of reinterpreted and reused, right, uh, to put amuletic text and uh, images on a different media, and then they evolved into different types of amulets, okay. W w did I stay in, a, in the time period there, Zach? Was that good? Yeah, close enough. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you.
fascinating material, and I'm sure we'll have um, time to revisit it during question period. Mm -hmm. And next, we'll hear from Suzanne. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, thanks, Chris, for leading off with the shiny things, because uh, I'm going to talk about some more of them. And uh, it's a particularly niche subject because nobody's done a big study or uh, or or an exhibition like I'd like to do on uh, on printing on fabric, specifically printing on silk. So I wanted to show you one of one of my favorite objects at the Newberry and a couple of ancillary things around it. Uh, mostly 17th century things, though there were earlier ones. Uh, let's see. So uh, we just took, uh, just or ended an exhibition on the Nova Reperta prints, and one of them was uh, the invention of, of silk printing, or excuse me, of silk production. Uh, here's Florentine women in the background. Silk is coming to Emperor Justinian in a purloined cane full of silkworm eggs. And then here's a whole other series Stradonis did on the life cycle of the silkworm, uh, including the mulberry tree, which is the only thing that silkworms could eat once they got to Europe. So you had to import those as well. Uh, so if you can't get something, clearly it's going to be more expensive and possibly uh, more fashionable. So here's, here's a little cocoon set for you and then those prints in the exhibition. Uh, if you wanna know more about the silkworms themselves, uh, uh, we did a whole separate little little fun thing about about that cycle, but I don't really have time to talk about that right now. All right, so here's something I helped buy for the Art Institute of Chicago when I worked there. It's enormous. Uh, the other thing I'm talking about is not nowhere nearly this big. That's why I'm giving you dimensions, and you'll see that this whole section down here is separately engraved, although most of it's mesotent. And uh, this is basically the summary of a. A doctoral thesis. And the idea was that if you printed your thesis fancily enough, in this case on this pink satin silk, or silk satin, uh, originally had brocade around the edges, perhaps uh, St. Ignatius would take pity on you and help you, uh, uh, help, help you graduate. Uh, but uh, not, not all of those, uh, not, those are not the only special occasion printings on silk. Uh, this is a little detail. You can see little ink squash up here uh, with a letter press and then on, on the side as well. Uh, but uh, there was also quite a lot of hand illumination added to this particular piece of silk, which is at the Newberry. And it's a celebratory broadside or poem uh, for the, uh, the 1624 wedding of, uh, uh, of Captain Peter uh, Waller, Wallier to uh, the extremely virginal, uh, apparently Elizabeth uh, de Nova Castro or Newcastle. I haven't really traced the family, I need to, but these are clearly their patron saints, Peter, Elizabeth. And uh, it's just a, it's a really unusual object. It seems to be unique in the world. I haven't been able to find it on, on paper either. And uh, the fact that there doesn't appear to be any printing up here suggests that it was intended to be uh, sort of luxuriously added to. I mean, you've got the you know family crest and uh, motto up here, uh, lots and lots of poetry about about uh, this wonderful union that will ensue, et cetera. Uh, it's a very standard type of uh, a, a printed border, relief border from the time. Um, and uh, I didn't really know much about the printer, Theodore Meyer, and uh, decided I needed to uh, look into that a little bit. We bought one book that's, again, involving uh, heraldry. Um, it's a, a book by a Scottish scholar uh, who, who was in, in Freiburg uh, uh, in Brisgau, uh, which is where this was printed. And this, he also did this book. I don't know, I don't know that they were also uh, producing the bindings for these, but this particular one was also bound in pink satin. So that sort of, I, I, had, I had to buy it, of course, at that point. But uh, just to show you how this gets even crazier in the 18th and 19th century, these are uh, two other recent acquisitions. Uh, this is a uh, 1782 imprint. It's just a few pages. It's a different, a different marriage, uh, apparently by a friend. Uh, there's not a whole lot of detail about who wrote the poetry and that's probably just as well. Uh, given how how uh, fluid it is, I think it's a little more interesting to look at at this contrast in the just lustrous, beautiful uh, uh, satin here. A little bit of hand coloring done 
in a very sort of twee, twee manner, but, uh, but very nicely done. Uh, and also, uh, also on there just to get, to have this sort of celebratory wedding fever continue. Um, this is another set of two that have stamped uh, details on the outside. Uh, and what was notable here was that it seemed, there seemed to have been two versions for this 1806 wedding and uh, there are two guest lists. So the printing actually depends on the version you get. And it looks like the type was entirely reset for each of these. It wasn't that they added on more to the end, uh, same printer, but, and then here in this one, it's actually uh, handwritten the date a little bit. So there's more, more going on here. I think, I think these may have been handed out to those specific individuals. So they needed to have it in as a souvenir, but with their names on it. Um, here's a little more of the poetry, which I don't have time to get into. But again, this is, this is a pink silk. Uh, there's a, more of a sat, uh, yellow or gold on this side. And you can just see how, how nice the uh, relief instruments look in here. Uh, so you could also print on, on other materials like linen, uh, though the same printers, so the printers, these, the, um, the Scottish Foley brothers, um, they also did silk. And uh, this is sort of one of my favorites. It's not the Newberry, but there's a multicolored different set of silk uh, in the collection in Scotland. Uh, but they really went, went all out in trying to create a luxuriousness of, of, of especially in the case of the silk, um, and these tiny little books, and this is actually coming back to the classical sources because there are several used for that. All right, and um, oh, sorry, I thought I had, that's probably enough, but, um, but yes, there are not a lot of these and I think we should talk about them more and look at them. Well, that's it. Thanks, Suzanne. We will, we will talk about them more in Q&A, sure. Um, next up, Shannon. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. And this, I imagine, will be something completely different. Zach, could you maybe just give me a thumbs up if you can see this? Okay, great. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to share with you today is extracted from a piece I wrote last year for the Dutch graphic design journal, Modes of Criticism. I've had to excise some beloved passages and examples, but you can find them in the longer print publication, which will also be made available in a freely available, sorry, a, a freely available online multimediated version sometime early next year. So there's something cinematic about the split flap display with its thousands of tiny panels, each featuring a painted or silk screen character fluttering around a central drum. You can imagine one flickering in the background of an airport scene in a film set in the heyday of air travel, its rotating letters and numbers spelling out a grammar of geographic possibility. We Americans of a certain age and location remember their anticipatory shiver on the transit boards in Amtrak's north, sorry, Northeast Corridor stations. The display's small moving analog parts sounded out and performed time's sifting and fluttering passage. Their choreography triggered and metered the frantic ballet of harried commuters rushing about below. Over the last two decades, most public split flap displays have been replaced by glowing LCD screens, many of them installed by the same company, Solari, that pioneered the old school mechanism in the 1950s, then adapted it for the digital age. Yet several electromechanical installations continue to chug along in the train stations and airports of Europe and Asia. And a few new boards have appeared, bespoke displays created for restaurants and museums, for the offices of nostalgic tech companies and the homes of wealthy private collectors. New split flap startups have appeared too, including one in Philadelphia. Several artists have also adopted the split flap to explore the materiality of code and its capacity to produce productive and pleasurable inefficiencies in an age of flat screens and algorithmic immediacy. Across these applications, old and new, we see that the split flap constitutes an adaptable design system, one that extends long traditions of public reading, while also broadcasting messages and embodying operational logics domain to the, comp sorry, to the computational age. We'll start with an abbreviated history. In 1903, when many railway stations used chalkboards and bulletin boards and even men or phonographs to call out arrivals and departures, New Yorker Eugene Fitch patented a cylindrical glass clock, lantern-like in form, sorry, lantern-like in form that featured indicating plates pivotally mounted upon a rotating part. 
his Plato clock, named after the metal plates, not the philosopher, inspired a host of consumer flip clock, flip clock designs designed throughout the 20th century. Meanwhile, Soleri, the old and awarded clock tower, tower clock company, have been making, well, tower clocks amidst the Dolomite Mountains in um, Perseus, Italy since 1725. These large public audiovisual interfaces serve to orient and synchronize entire neighborhoods and towns. In 1948, two of the six Solari brothers, Fermo and Remigio, built a new factory in Udine, where Remigio began experimenting with the flip unit. Over the next decades, Solari Udine, in collaboration with many notable Italian industrial designers, produced its own selection of award-winning tabletop flip clocks. As Solari's first clock, the Chief for Five, appeared in 1956, the company was also implementing the split flap on a much larger scale, which seems fitting given their familiarity with grand public timepieces. Emilio Canducio, a Solari product specialist stationed in Long Island City, New York, told me that the company fielded a request from a Belgian train station to install a transit information display system featuring destinations, tracks, and times in the Liege railway station. And that's where the public flipboard began its multi-decade journey, ultimately appearing in countless railway stations and airports around the globe and compelling new modes of public reading. The split flaps spread coincided with the so-called golden age of commercial air travel and Solari boards hold it, hell, sorry, hung in two of its temples, Aero Saarinen's TWA terminal and JFK airport, New York, and his Dulles International Airport in Washington, DC. Another boon was the 1971 emergence of Amtrak, which sought to revive America's trail travel and refresh stations long neglected by their former private owners. While more and more passengers were crossing continents and circumnavigating the globe at record speeds, a, geography rent, sorry, a geographic rendering of time via the traditional round uh, clock face made way for flickering lines of code. Code and encryption were crucial to the Cold War context from which the split flap arose, and data processing was becoming ever more central to the expanding realm of global logistics. The boards also lived, and in some cases still live, in stock exchanges, ferry terminals, TV studios, movie theaters, racetracks, and TV studios, which I think I said twice. Anyway, TV studios. In each case, the audiovisual flutter signaled an urgent information update a new stock price, a new score, a new case in the courtroom down the hall. In 1973, Solari made three huge boards for the Philadelphia Convention Center, but then they couldn't fit them through the doors. Candusio isn't sure what happened to them. Today, a few stations and terminals still house functional installations. I don't have time to review all of them here. Here you see uh, uh, Newark, um, the Newark Railway Station, yet their maintenance has proven to be quite a challenge. And then we move on to the last section. Most stations opted instead for an upgrade to newer display technologies. The old electromechanical sign in Philadelphia's Penn Station, Amtrak's last survivor, was controlled by computers running Windows 95 and had been known to fail for months at a time. The new board, installed in January 2019, promised to facilitate future tech upgrades, comply with the Americans for Disabilities Act, and modernize the station. While the old split flap now resides at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Lancaster County, the new board streams listings across a triptych of conjoined LCD screens. The seams between those screens introduce small misalignments in the text, which seems fitting given the errancy of American uh, train travel. New Haven replaced its split flap in 2014, and New York's Penn Station, which had installed a digital homage to the split flap in the early 2000s, abandoned the analog pretense and adopted a constellation of glaring LCDs in 2016. A distributed topology of screens promises decreased, sorry, decreased congestion and smoother passenger flows, but it sacrifices a communal focal point and a synchronizing rhythm, what Ingrid Safran calls a spinning, clacking, pre-digital hearth. The mechanical board was the physical. The mechanical board was the physical manifestation of motion. Now the LCD's digital motion, the screen refresh, the chromatic flip of a pixel, is too fast for the human eye to discern. There's no cue or push notification for the arrival of a new datum. We don't know when to look up, so we stare at the screen, waiting for something to happen. 
Some clients have requested a nostalgic solution to this user experience challenge. Uh, Newark's board, a video wall composed of 16 monitors, is a digital split flap replica, complete with clickety clacking sound effects. Boston's digital sign, installed in 2004, emits a sonic flutter too. These skeuomorphic displays allow for both the promised efficiencies and precision of 21st century data management, while also gesturing toward the haptic engagement and charisma of the beloved 20th century interface. Solari is still making split flaps, Kendusio told me, but only for special cases for which they offer complete customization. Split flap startup Oat Foundry, meanwhile, created a custom board for the Grow with Google Digital Skills Training Center in New York, where the display serves pedagogical and marketing purposes. It renders digital technologies, I'm not sure why this isn't advancing. It renders digital and mark, I'm um, sorry, it renders digital technologies mechanically comprehensible and cultivates a physical character for the brand, while it also, according to its creators, adds an element of magic to information. And here you see the, the Google installation. Information's magic, or its object, sorry, its opposite, demystification. These are among the concerns of contemporary artists deploying split flap technology to comment on digital culture, global transit, and public communication. While the early split flap embodied the operative logics of an emerging computational era, the rhetorics of Cold War code and the mechanics and affect of new means of global travel, contemporary artists demonstrate how the same mechanism indexes digital technology's materiality, its composition of bits and packets, the electronic roots and physical geographies those units traverse, and the various temporalities inherent in computation. The longer article features a work, the work of about a dozen split flap artists who explore such themes, but I'll feature just two in closing. Labow's signal to noise also engages with fleetingness. Oops, there we go. Labow's signal to noise from 2010 also engages with fleetingness and algorithmic meaning making. The artist created a, a cyclorama-like installation consisting of four rows of stripped down flat modules salvaged from a Belgian train station. As those modules spin at variable speeds through random characters, the sheer volume of mechanical operations and computational processing is rendered palpably audible. When an algorithm, sorry, when an algorithm detects that an English word of three or more letters has appeared on adjacent modules, a signal amidst all the noise, those flaps hold their position for a few beats. The piece implicitly questions the logics and methods of massive data collection, and it highlights the labor and energy required for its processing. Signal to Noise's readers read its signals on two levels. In waiting to crack the occasional intelligible code, visitors hear and feel the, elect sorry, the electrical signals that generate it. And then finally, Shilpa Gupta's 240001, meanwhile, uses a modest single row split flap to unfurl a narrative about travel and belonging, security and national identity. Writing in the first person signal, sorry, singular, I look out and wait for the train to go by, one of her, one of kind of the manifestations reads, while incorporating misspellings, omissions, and irregular spacing. Gupta transforms a medium typically used to broadcast objective logistical information into a poignant personal travel diary. 240001 makes personal time public, like a personal split flap alarm clock scaled up to a clock tower. The mechanical multisensoriality of the split flap signals the persistence of a particular kind of haptic public reading that we find evidenced in ancient public oratory and architectural inscriptions and the new mass publications hawked on street corners and posted in public kiosks in the 19th century and in the open air book markets of many contemporary cities. Public literacy has long been dynamic and embodied. It has oriented the public's gaze, directed its movements, underscored its rhythms. Solari, as its name implies, illuminates the persistent importance of these public texts. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. uh, and closing out our group, um, Jennifer Park, then we'll have Q&A. Okay. Um... Zach, could you also give me an indication if you could? Okay, perfect. Um, 
so I want to begin just by um, thanking uh, um, my fellow panelists here and um, as well as the organizer of uh, organizers of this this wonderful series so Zach, um, John and Jerry for the invitation to participate in this exciting session um, to Philip for all of his help um, and to the material text community. Thank you all so much for um, for being here. Um, so I'll be speaking about um, a particular object in relation to um, what's, uh, what's a newer, larger project on um, or broadly considering ephemeral geographies and playing cards. Um, and so the playing cards I'll be speaking to today are specifically uh, geographical decks of um, playing cards. Um, and in preparing for this talk, I did realize I um, I think I was supposed to choose um, sort of one object. And so I'm gonna focus um, on, on this particular deck, but also kind of gesture out to some of the other um, geographical playing card decks that I've um, been finding really interesting in my research. Um, this one is a fascinating set called The Court Game of Geography, um, printed in 1839 um, and held at the Newberry Library in Chicago. Um, and actually, I have my wonderful co-panelist Suzanne here to thank for introducing me um, to this deck when I was at the Newberry last year doing some research for this project. And as you can see here, just um, uh, you know, just from this, this sort of title page of the instructional booklet, um, uh, alone, this object, this deck of playing cards rests at the intersection of games and science, um, which is an intersection that I've been interested in exploring, um, as well as questions about race and empire, um, as we'll uh, see shortly. Um, as I mentioned, the deck uh, was printed in 1839 in London. Um, the publishers, William and Henry Rock, are advertised um, here as publishers of scientific games. And so I've kind of been interested in that, um, uh, you know, that sort of set of, of material texts. So as I mentioned, I'm interested in this object and other geographical playing card decks as material texts that are engaging questions of um, race and empire in their material textuality. And I wanted to start with this visual overview just to foreground, for example, um, some problematic depictions, you know, given that the English reader or player um, in using these geographical cards um, is navigating a complex set of significations. So, you know, between the symbolic um, register of the suits and the values of the cards and gameplay um, and the hierarchical order that um, is sort of built into this uh, within the suits of the playing card deck and possibly among the suits of the playing card deck. What does it mean to see, um, you know, what appears to be here, um, indigenous figures on certain cards? How are the relational dynamics between nations and peoples of the world meant to be read, um, especially when they're kind of divided up into, um, into kind of individual playing cards here? And I want to mention that I'm coming from a literary studies background, um, specifically training in early modern um, English texts. So, you know, primarily 16th and 17th century texts. So this 1839 deck from the Newberry is somewhat beyond my period of expertise, but nonetheless, it has provided a really helpful and powerful example um, of, of where we sort of end up with some of the geographical playing card decks that are coming out of 17th century England and Europe at large. Um, and among the English and French decks that I've seen so far, the general design seems to be that the hearts are used to represent nations of um, Europe, uh, the diamonds for Asia, the spades for Africa, and the clubs for America. Although in this particular deck, the spades and the clubs um, are reversed. So um, as you can see here, America is being represented by the suit of spades. Um, and I've also just, you know, provided the, the call number um, in case anyone is sort of interested in, uh, in, in looking it up once, um, once we're able to visit, um, visit the archives again. Um, and uh, what, what's also featured in this particular slide is the, the cover case that um, the cards um, have come in. And I'll give us a chance to look again at the America um, court cards a bit later um, as well. So this deck, this 1839 court game of geography is accompanied by an instruction booklet that provides some crucial information about um, the design of a rationale behind the deck, as well as sort of briefly how it was to be used or played. So you'll be able to see here exactly um, why it is that an object um, like this raises some important questions about colonial and imperial histories. Uh, 
And because I think that this provides some important context, I just want to read this, read out um, this introduction to the deck here, which begins by saying that, and I quote, um, this is truly a royal game. Uh, the four suits represent the four quarters of the world, and each of the pip cards represents a nation. The arrangement of the different countries has been so made that the suit designates their geographical position and their relative importance corresponds with the numerical value of the card. Thus, in Europe, the British Isles, Russia and Europe, France, Austria, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Turkey, Prussia, the Netherlands are represented by hearts from the 10 to the deuce. So by remembering that Spain is painted as the six of hearts, the player is reminded that Spain is in Europe and of an importance among European nations corresponding to the six in cards, being only inferior to the British Isles, uh, the 10, Russia and Europe, the nine, France, the eight, and Austria, the seven. The mind is thus familiarized with the geographical position and relative importance of the different nations of the earth um, and instruction in the useful science of geography combined with pleasing and elegant amusement. Um, and I've just sort of highlighted some words here just to, you know, um, uh, it's just kind of interesting to note the language and rhetoric that's being used to establish um, a particular argument of, of hierarchy and, and importance um, here. And, um, and so I finally want to show more of, of this object now for the remainder of the presentation here um, to show how this rational uh, rationale plays itself out. The hierarchy that's always, uh, that is already built into the design of the playing cards um, in the court cards, as well as the pip cards or the numbered cards um, already provides a kind of structure for making an argument about empire, um, about um, an importance of a nation um, within the context of the global, um, the, the world at large. So we can see here, since this deck was printed in England, that the makers have given the British Isles pride of place as the Ten of Hearts, the highest among the pip cards. Um, king George IV is figured thus as the King of Hearts. Um, um, and uh, here then is a quick overview of um, of what's provided as a, a certain kind of table of contents or the, the sort of contents of the cards um, called here the explanation of the cards as well as um, quote uh, characters represented by the court game cards. Um, and I wanted to provide this here as reference. Um, I'm happy to return to it during questions if anyone is interested in taking um, another look, um, but just to give you a sense of, um, of the kind of organization that's being provided in the instructional booklet as you kind of encounter um, the cards. Um, and at this point, I just want to give a sense of what the court cards are um, looking like for each of the suits. Uh, I'm sorry about the quality of some of these um, images or the resolution, but um, hopefully you're, you're, um, you'll be able to get a sense here. Um, so how the characters, right, that are being um, kind of named in the table of contents are actually figured on the cards themselves and the order in which they're listed. So here we be begin with the suit of hearts representing Europe. Um, and then here we've got the suit of diamonds representing Asia, and I'm following the order here that was um, given in that um, that listing, right? So this is this is how they've they've ordered it. Here we have gotten, um, or we have the the suit of uh, clubs um, representing Africa. And then finally, to return to this one, we've got the suit of spades representing um, America. And just to, um, just to show you kind of a side by side of how we're meant to be reading these characters or figures that are represented on these cards, um, I have here um, the uh, American court cards alongside their listing in the table of contents, um, right? And so um, what we have is, uh, you know, Washington as um, the king of spades here. Um, uh, Neala of Canada being featured on the Queen of Spades, um, Talasco of Mexico being featured as the Knave um, of Spades. But even just kind of looking at the way that these figures are being represented here, the kind of hierarchy that they're being mapped onto, we can already kind of, um, you know, uh, 
see the the kind of blatant ways that um, certain arguments and um, certain narratives are are being made um, and what to kind of make of the fact that they're being um, placed on these playing cards, right, um, to be used for entertainment as well as ed educational purposes. Um, and I just want to end with a bit of a gesture to, to the kinds of questions that I'm sorting through when writing and thinking about an object like this, um, especially thinking about the way that playing cards engage um, human interaction with, um, with this kind of printed matter, how that interaction with these material objects might have influenced early modern ideas about race and world division. So playing cards, um, you know, as material ephemera were meant to be rearranged, shuffled, passed actively from one participant to another. Um, you know, given that level of interactivity, what um, ramifications does this active engagement with the materiality of playing cards have for the argument that these decks make about global hierarchies? And I've been influenced by Sarika Davies' wonderful work with maps in her Renaissance ethnography and the invention of the human and how maps, and I quote her, constituted ethnographic knowledge and inflected the ways in which readers understood human variety. So in other words, if maps already made certain kinds of transcultural arguments, what role did geographical playing cards um, play, especially as different decks parse out different kinds of geographical information, um, uh, you know, be it cartographic information, which sometimes appears on, on some of these decks, uh, or pseudo ethnographic information. And I have a few examples of 17th century cards here just to provide a little bit of a broader um, context. Um, uh, sort of the, the large um, image on the right uh, is, uh, is an uncut sheet um, circa 1669 of, of French cards, um, Les Tables de la Géographie, um, and it's held at the Kislak Center. Um, and uh, this is thanks to John. Um, and, and actually, I was able to switch in really quickly the, the, um, the nicely digitized image here. Um, uh, and, and so I think that's, um, that's now digitized and kind of made available. Um, but you can kind of um, see this is you know, 17th century um, French uh, set of ge uh, geographical cards um, and, you know, um, and the way that they've kind of um, listed these kinds of um, divisions. On the top um, left um, is actually, I think, an, an earlier sort of, um, uh, or from an earlier printing of the same set of cards, um, uh, I believe circa 1651. And this one is just a digitized one from um, the Bibliothèque Nationale um, in France. Um, and, and on the bottom left is um, a kind of um, a, a title page um, engraving um, from um, a deck that was printed by Henry Brome. Um, and um, this is a uh, uh, circa 1676. Um, and while I'm not, I haven't shown the cards here, it's an English deck that, um, that actually borrows very heavily and in fact really kind of imitates um, the French version that we see here. Um, and so we, we see the same kind of layout, um, except that um, they've made you know, other kinds of, um, uh, of changes. So, you know, as an English deck, um, again, the, the British Isles um, are going to have a, have pride of place rather than France. Um, and they both kind of make um, arguments about where the other nation should stand. I think the Brome deck placed um, France maybe, uh, maybe like, seven, seven of hearts or so, but I think that the French deck um, lists the British Isles as, as a three of hearts. So we, we start to see um, what the different nations sort of think about, uh, think about each other. Um, uh, and then finally here, um, what we have is uh, a, a deck um, printed by um, Henry Wynne Stanley around the same time as the Brome decks of 1676. And um, these are images that are um, from the British uh, Museum um, and you can see that you know these are also classified as geographical playing cards, um, but um, you know very different in terms of um, the kinds of uh, the, the, the layout, um, the kind of information that they're providing here. And so we get some you know, again pseudo ethnographic information as well as problematic representations of different nations and different peoples. Um, and I think um, just to kind of end with some questions, you know, um, one of the questions that really stands out to me, um, you know, especially in light of um, Sarika Davies's work um, and these different kinds of geographical playing cards is, you know, what happens when claims about human diversity um, or differences between peoples, differences between nations, um, uh, you know, what happens to those claims when it becomes a game, right? Um, 
and I'm thinking back also to the um, uh, to the Newberry deck and um, the 1839 deck, which I believe in the instruction book, um, it specifically um, lists uh, directions for a game um, uh, where the winner is determined by who is in possession of all the cards. So literally it's a game of world domination. Um, so what to kind of make of that? Um, and you know, this this has actually been a real treat to, to kind of revisit this newer project and to have a chance to think about these playing cards, um, especially as I sort of sort through questions about um, you know, how these cards as material texts are engaging processes, uh, processes of reading and interaction to shape ideas about what I thought um, might, be, um, might be conceptualized as the playability of these imperial and colonial hierarchies. And I think initially, um, I, I thought that the playability, right, through these cards um, implied a, 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 the potential of, a, of, of pliability of these imperial colonial hierarchies. Um, but, you know, as I've been doing a little bit more work in this, I, you know, um, I, I began to kind of wonder that um, maybe that connection I was seeing between playability and pliability uh, might not be entirely accurate. It's, it maybe it's something to be questioned, um, that the playability does not actually in indicate the pliability of the hierarchies. Um, and so perhaps I'll end kind of with a question to ponder with regard to writing about geographical playing cards as ephemeral material texts. To what extent might the very interaction we have with material ephemera and gameplay, the playability of these material texts actually uphold and reinforce the problematic hierarchies that are being proposed um, you know, in these um, in these decks, right? And so if we have, for example, in the um, in the images that that I have here, you know, England, um, uh, you know, sort of um, London as the, the king of hearts here um, and, uh, you know, India being presented as um, the, the four of diamonds, um, you know, to what extent, you know, the, the fact that those hierarchies are now kind of printed onto these cards and are being played by, uh, being played, um, having those values in mind, um, do we really not see, uh, you know, real kind of mobility, right, between those hierarchies? Um, and so I will, uh, oops, I will end there. Um, so thank you so much. I look forward to discussing all of these wonderful objects um, further with you all. Thank you. Yes. So, Jennifer, great. Um, so the floor is open for um, questions. Uh, as I said, you can use the little raise hand function or you can um, put a question in the chat. Thank you also to Jennifer for doing what I failed to do at the beginning, which is introducing us. Um, my fellow organizers, so just in case, I'm Zach Lesser, I'm in the English Department at Penn, um, Jerry Singerman, who's Humanities Editor at the Penn Press. Hello. And John Pollack, who's Curator in the Kislak Center. And Philip Mogan, who is Bristol Schoenberg uh, Fellow in the History of Material Text. So that's that's who we are. So that hopefully gave you time to formulate um, some questions if you, if you want to um, raise your little blue hand, go ahead. I thought one of the interesting points of overlap was um, the way that these objects make us think about the different kinds of use um, and interaction with them and how that might affect our understanding of their text or so the kind of gamification that you were talking about, Jennifer, or you know what we do in the railway station or the airport. Um, you know, what, what, what do we do with these amulets? Are they, Know, apotropaic or, or, or are they just a copy book? The silk is an interesting case too because it can kind of slide between something that looks pretty familiar to book historians, like just a different substrate, but it's a book, to something that looks a bit different, like the the wedding commemoration, which looks almost like a, 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 a Jewish ketubah, you know, that you would hang on the wall or something is what I was thinking of, these commemorative, highly, um, elaborate and expensive, I would imagine, objects with, with hand illumination. So that was just one thing that, you know, it occurred to me most of, most of the talks kind of prompted um, a different way of thinking about both the physical and the mental interaction with the object. Um, but you don't have to talk about that right now. Um, because we'll get a question from Laura. Um, hi, thank you to all of you for just these wonderful um, presentations. It's so much food for thought. And I actually just had a very specific um, question out of uh, Suzanne's talk, because I just <laughs> sent out uh, in the chat an image of this silk um, 
menu that's in a scrapbook at Penn. So this sort of fits with our talk last week on scrapbooks. And it's 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 in one of our theatrical scrap, scrapbooks from the 19th century. So it's somebody had a night at the theater and they pasted in their ticket and their playbill and their menu. But um, I was wondering because I've, I'm a former Newberian and I was so pleased to see some of their wonderful collections highlighted in two of these talks. Um, but in your talk, you were talking about silk printing that's, um, I mean, most of the items you were showing were for sort of, you know, special occasions or they're supposed to be very large and grandiose. And I wondered if you knew, because I just don't know, I, I know this little menu from Penn, but do you know of any other, like just sort of ephemeral objects like this menu, or if you run across those at the Newberry or other kinds of objects that were printed on silk or fabric and were clearly not meant to be framed or, or treasured necessarily, but were more sort of ephemeral, like a menu or a playbill or something like that. Oh, absolutely. There, there are plenty of, uh... There, there, I just looked at it. Uh, there, there, there are plenty of, of menus. Uh, I mean, I think it's similar to something like 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 Lautrec was making lithographic ones for sort of one-offs. It's kind of a similar thing, uh, but fancier. Uh, there's definitely theatrical related performance uh, programs that are like this. Uh, I mean, I think it, it sort of feels a little bit like like when they would they would do you know printed fans for in the you know in the 16th century and hand them out at events um, to people it's sort of like that uh, yeah no they they really it, it it's it's just making making it a little little shinier it really is and I think and I think there I think touch actually has a lot to do with it too because why would you why would you want this if you can't touch it uh, I mean I I, I kind of I mean, I was just thinking, thinking about the box on Jennifer's card, card uh, cards is, is pretty fancy too. So it's sort of like, how do you package it? You know, is this something that someone would keep? Would it go on the wall? I mean, I think, I think the thesis I showed was on the wall because it had that sort of stitched brocade layer at some point. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you did like, who wanted this? I mean, who was, who was going to keep somebody else's, you know, wedding poetry? I don't know. You're so right about the tactile dimension to it because you know mm -hmm. that that would be part of it. Although it makes it fall apart faster, so I'm sure the conservators are happier than not having yeah, it. Done. Yeah, there's only there's only so much salvage. <laughs> I mean, you can only have one one sort of ham on it at a time unless you unless you put the brocade on it. But yeah, no, there's there's definitely lots um, into the into the 19th century through the 19th century. There's even photography printed on silk later. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, Great. I don't know. So yes, yes That's is my wonderful. answer avenue of um, exploration because I haven't yeah. had a lot of parade, also parade uh, par parade ribbons uh, oh, often yeah. often they could be switched mm. uh, funeral or parade so you have black on one side uh, colorful on the other yeah thank you Lilian uh, thank you very much I would like to follow up uh, Laura's question um, to Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder whether you can tell us something more about where the silk comes from. Uh, Freiburg is obviously at the French border. Um, so there might be a trade from France to Germany at this point, at the German lands. If you look at other areas of Germany, you will find a very peculiar situation. Um, let's look, for example, at Berlin. Uh, you have imported silks. Uh, they come from Asia or from France. You have a very risky business in silk. Silkworms are not very good in terms of survival rate in Germany. It failed completely when they tried to do it in Sweden. But because it was a risky business, it became a niche business for Jews. As you know, Moses Mendelssohn was a silk merchant. He was primarily working in a silk factory. He was just doing philosophy early in the morning. And so were quite a number of families in Prussia and elsewhere. So the exoticism of silk, so to say, was something that came from either outside or within, as it was called in Germany, the colonies within. So I wonder whether you know where the silk is coming from or whether anything of this is known or attached to the use once it gets printed. I, I wish I knew. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've had some textile uh, historians look at some of the things we have 
And uh, it's it generally, it's very difficult to date silk at all, uh, even for the purposes of, you know, was this a contemporary printing? Because there's some, there's a whole group of, of images taken from copper plates that could have been done later, like a lot of Durer prints, for instance, are reprinted in the 18th century. Uh, but in terms of, of the actual source, uh, no, I haven't, I have, I would love to know where this piece of silk came from. That's, that would be very helpful. I mean, from, from the, the work I just did for the Nova Reperta project, uh, I know that I mean, France and Italy especially were very, uh, very much pushing the industry, trying to get people to, to grow mulberry trees. I mean, there were major benefits to people who could put them on their estates and things, but no, I think I haven't seen as much in Germany. So it's, I, I, I think you're right. I don't think it would have- in, in part of Germany, it was a so-called Jewish business. Yeah, so then you wouldn't, I guess you wouldn't talk about it. But no, I, I really need to, I'll, I'll email you. I want to know more about this. Thank you. I, I had a thought. Um, well, there's many interesting connections here, one of which is is between silk, what Suzanne was talking about with silk and what Jennifer was talking about. You know, there's, of course, a, a submerged huge global history in these silk printings. Um, what's fascinating about the cards is it's it's just, it's all right there completely on the surface. And so one one of the thoughts I had is kind of the, you know, when you get these geographical cards, it's almost like, do we, it, you, you, you almost don't even need the kind of methodologies of reading that we've learned from like post-colonial studies and critical race. It's so upfront, the kind of reading we might apply to the silk printings, right, is right there. Um, so that was one thought I had. And I also, I wanted to think more too about the, um, cause I love those split flap displays. And I feel like what was so thrilling about them was always the chance that something would go horribly wrong with them because of the way they split the letters in half. You might get like the top of a B and the bottom of an X or something together, you know? And the artist seems to be playing with that, the one who does the kind of library at Babel like thing where any, you know, the random word pops up and gets highlighted, which is very Borgesian. And that kind of play in the split flap with the the materiality of letter forms themselves, right? The kind of thrill of of playing with that materiality made me think also about in Chris's talk, the way it seemed like, at least in this amulet, there perhaps the Arabic is just fake Arabic and it's simply the, you know, the, the letter forms and the Greek is, it's either bad and half forgotten Greek or someone who more is just indicating Greekness, like Arabicness, like to what extent is the shapes of letters there? In both of those cases, it seems to me that there's something about the shape of the letter that's itself fascinating and being played with. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about my ramblings. I'd like to just right. chip in on that, um, Zach, because uh, Simka Gross gave a talk, what, three weeks ago, uh, about dishes that are buried uh, in the doors of, of Hebrew houses, which have um, a mixture of Hebrew writing that's decipherable, but quite often just completely garbled. In other words, it doesn't mean anything but is, is imitated nonetheless. It's imitated between different scribes who use the same script. I forget what, I mean, this is early stuff. I forget what the dates he was talking about here. Most of these dishes are, but uh, it's the same kind of problem that Zach's talking about, which is to what extent, in other words, are magical scripts often meant to be magical, not because they have meaning, but because they have a certain sort of visual power which, which may be purely bound up, as Zach was suggesting, with Arabicness or Greekness, whether or not you know what they're saying. Do you want to take that, Chris, since I think the most recent question was kind of most pertinent to, to your presentation? Yeah. The it is true, those, the, those Aramaic uh, bowls uh, do have this, uh, they, they call it pseudo script. Um, the, what, what's interesting about the, the bronze plaque in Paris is that you, you can see a, a kind of evolution there. I, I do think that the Arabic was meant to be put on an amulet, 
all right? But it's, and it's probably not Arabic as, as Zachary said. Um, the, the inscriptions on most of the magical gems are um, unintelligible. I mean, occasionally, they, but they, they often have the names repeated um, in the same way over you know, the 30 or 40 gems. And in the magical papyri, they tell you in the handbooks, they tell you how many letters the magical name has so you don't leave one of them off. All right, so there, so there is a, a, an idea that these are powerful but unintelligible. So that's, and, and the more unintelligible, the more valuable we think they are because the, some, of these, some of these recipes are, go, are very long. Some of, these, the, some, of the, uh, some of the inscriptions on gold foil run to 90, 100 uh, lines of unintelligible names. That, but, but just by having the names written down, rolled up and put into a, a, a bronze tube that you wear around your neck, that would, that would somehow protect you. So. I just also add that I'm tr I was trying to connect this um, 20th century, 20, 21st century example to longer histories of public reading. And we can see kind of long histories of, kind of public <coughs> architectural inscription, for instance, is using scripts that are not meant to be intelligible, that they're so ornate that they are intentionally unintelligible to communicate more affective types of, the message is more affective than it is semantic. And then we can also look at interesting histories of kind of asymic writing in the arts you know, um, mag uh, uh, made up scripts, magical scripts. Um, in this case, with the split flap, I think a lot of the more contemporary artistic experiments are playing with the way that the mechanical, the mechanism of the of the object seems to call for a particular kind of uh, structure of language and then uh, kind of um, hacking the code to some degree or doing away with writing altogether and using the fluttering mechanism as a means of kind of rolling through chromatic trans uh, uh, tra chromatic progression. So, um, so it's completely erasing the, the textual content and just using the, the, the substrate itself as, an, as a kind of an artistic medium, as a, um, a chromatic medium. I mean, that's true in a way of the silk printing as well. When we get the letterpress printing, it's the, the letterpress is identical. It's the substrate. It's purely the, 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 the silk that is carrying the meaning beyond the text there. So in a way that's playing, I think, in a very similar way as some of the artists are playing with the split flap, they're playing with the substrate of you know paper or paper substitute. Um, Eleanor, go ahead. Thanks so much. I, I loved all of these talks. I found them very fascinating. And I do think um, the element of communication and proliferation of different types of communication to play and pliability um, extends um, through all of these to, to new objects. And um, I mean, I'm thinking of consumer culture and textiles with the playing card dress that connect and the shuffling, which the shuffling of course goes to what Shannon there. I mean, there are a lots of kind of just conceptual uh, uh, connections. But I was also thinking Jennifer in terms of yours with the connection of these playing cards as both um, trendy and topical um, in terms of uh, geographical because of early modern interest and in, you know, exploration. And then of course the questions that you're asking. But I'm wondering if you're ever reading them outside of geographical, that subgenre, and looking at them at the topical, I'm thinking of the financial ones for the satirical South Sea bubble playing cards. And do you know, I mean, that kind of, um, uh, I mean, that, certainly the people that lost in the um, South Sea bubble, when their bubble burst, it was, it was play, but it was no fun, you know? So, uh, so I was just wondering if you've looked at those throughout, and they also, I think they had, um, oh, Beggar's Opera, you know, so they were almost like, you know, McDonald's and Little Mermaid, you know, you had something and then you would have these other kinds of swag or souvenirs. And I, and I see kind of elements in all of these talks, but it made me think when I was listening to yours about the playing cards, Jennifer. I liked them all very much. <laughs> Wait, could you say a little bit more about um, those particular objects you were, you were mentioning? Sure. 
Um, I mean, there is a deck in the 1720s of South Sea playing cards. And they a map, they, um, uh, you know, one deck, I mean, one, um, what are the two, you know, their, their colors. Um, um, one maps um, takes a satirical look at the politics, if I'm not mistaken, and the financial market, and the other of the disaster and the human cost. I mean, these playing cards, I have a, um, there was somebody that, um, you know, made these up in Edinburgh, facsimiles. I don't have my set here, I grabbed them. And they're my, I live in DC, they're in Philadelphia. <laughs> so, um, but they, the other is human interest. And the John, you know, the uh, gays beggar opera, they're, they're the main characters. That's why I was making the comparison. So I definitely think I would be looking in terms of the subgenre of geography too. But I would also be looking cross because I was saying, what are these playing cards? And when you were talking about playing, what are they doing? I mean, here you're playing about the first stock market crash and they turn them into playing cards. So it's, you know, it's the same kind of, I mean, so does that make sense? Am I explaining it enough? I, I think so. Yeah, I, because I think um, like I've been really interested in other um, other kinds of um, of playing cards in the seventeenth century, and, and you're right, right? They're not all geographical playing cards, um, but there's, for example, a set of um, of carving cards that mm -hmm. provide instructions on how to carve different kinds mm -hmm. of food and how to be the the proper you know host or hostess, um, and astronomical cards, um, but also um, you know uh, I think you know different kinds of um, satirical and um, uh, and, and certain kinds of decks that are, um, you know, making arguments about the Popish plot and the, the yeah. gun plot. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I was looking at a, a couple of decks of those and it's, um, I think something that I was trying to figure out was, you know, how the, the kind of value system that's sort of, sort of built into the mm -hmm. card deck um, is affecting the, the narrative that they're trying to kind of shape. And it didn't, it, it didn't quite like one of the decks I was looking at didn't quite make sense to me. I think it sort of jumped from, you know, like the five of diamonds to like the king of, you know, um, you know, something else um, in, in terms of the progression of the narrative. And I was kind of curious about that. Um, but I think you're absolutely right about kind of, you know, not just sort of looking um, within the realm of kind of um, geography, but also, uh, as you were kind of saying, um, kind of laterally to, you know, um, other kinds of objects of, of this type and, and, you know, how those might be kind of playing into different ideas of pliability of, of narratives and argument. Just very quickly, there's going to be cultural differences, I think, too, because in imaginary maps, there are big differences between England and France. Uh, France will have maps of love and England has maps of marriage. England seems to dwell on institutions compared to concepts and emotions, just like plot and plot, uh, plot and plot and, um, you know, whatnot, the cultural differences. Um, we, we had a, a question in the chat from Danny Snelson about sound. Um, the, the sound of the split flap turning to indicate an update. Um, he also mentions the rustle of silk. Um, and we might think about the kinds of sounds that are seem to be invoked or happening sort of just off stage, the sounds involved in playing a card game um, that we don't know exactly, you know, what game was played or the sounds uh, of perhaps some of these words, you know, that seem like nonsense or magic words where the sound of these, if you pronounce them, perhaps they have some magical power. So, uh, you know, I think Danny's um, picking up on a thread here, the way that um, sound is, is a component of the experience of each of these. I don't know if anyone wants to, to address that in some way. Peter, it looks like you're trying to say something, but you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I was really fascinated by Shannon, what you were saying about the addition of the click clack sound. And there's a, a word that's now being used by people in, in sort of new technological studies called skewermorph. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll write it to the, to the chat, but the skewermorph, it describes the nostalgic incorporation 
of an old technology into a new technology, which is often connected to, to sound. Uh, an example is digital cameras. They actually add a click <coughs> so that, you know, I didn't even know that. When I first went to a, you know, a, was taking photographs in a rare book library, they said, turn the click off. I had no <laughs> idea what they were talking about. I thought the camera actually made the click, but no, it was to, to capture what old kit cameras sounded like. They made a click. Uh, or with stamps, that stamps kept a sort of zigzag um, edge to them, um, postage stamps, long after you, they sold them in sheets where you tore them, you know, uh, uh, so that's the reason for those zigzags was because you tore them um, from the sheet, but then they, when they were just stuck on a background. So I think you, it's a very useful term that, you know, um, um, uh, skewermorph to describe what really is a very, very widespread practice, the way old technologies come back uh, in, in new technologies in sort of nostalgic form. So I, I just thought that was a wonderful insight. I mean, I, I, I thought the whole thing, I, all these talks are fabulous, but I, you know, I was particularly struck by thinking about these stations that we've all spent time in or airports and thinking, I just hadn't really noticed that even, the, the lead displays, you know, taking over and the, 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 the lack of sound. And then I love this notion of adding sound. I don't know if you have other examples of that, Shannon. Where I just think sound is a, what Zach was saying, the, the question of sound is a very interesting one anyway and how it functions. I, so yes, I actually used the word skew more from the talk, but I kind of probably garbled it and you might not have heard it, but um, yeah, this was a case where uh, the, the material qualities of the text kind of um, call for a particular form of reading. If it's elevated in the sky, if it's kind of a glaring screen, the scale of the text either um, allows for kind of quick glances or acquires kind of close continual attention. And in this case, because of the placement of, of in a crowded hall for where passengers, thousands of passengers are kind of crossing in front of one another. Uh, people can't be staring up the entire time. So they often need some type of a cue to let them know when an important datum has changed and therefore we need your attention again. So when the, we had to switch to LED screens, there were several clients who actually requested to reintegrate. And Danny asked a question of whether it's a recording of an analog sign or if it's a kind of a digitally simulated. I'm not sure, I'm imagining it's the latter, a digital simulation of what an analog sign uh, sounded like. And there are plenty of other examples, including the click of a camera that you mentioned. You might remember early iPads, the book reader had the sound. Not only did you have to turn a little page, but there was also a swishing sound of a page being turned. But in the sound of the case, the split off, it's not just gratuitous. It's not pure nostalgia. It actually serves an important kind of public reading um, kind of interpolation um, uh, purpose. And there are artists also to answer Danny's questions who are playing with the sound. I think Lab Al, which is one of the videos I showed near the end. I think the sonic experience, there's also, I'm forgetting some of the other names of the artists that I had to cut out, where this militaristic marching sound is an integral part to not only the, the uh, message that the, the, the text they're using, uh, they're often making kind of critiques of colonialism, critiques of travel, et cetera. And they have this kind of militaristic um, rhythm that is, a soundtrack that's cultivated in the installation through the mechanism. Uh, the the nostalgic, the temporal um, kind of uh, overlays of skewer morphs um, reminds me of a comment that Sarah Wasserman made in the chat. She says, I'm struck that all four objects are linked because they appear to you as researchers as untimely. They all embed histories of labor and craft that seem anachronistic, either belated and obsolete or ahead of their time. I feel like the objects are striking because they call for material methods of addressing temporality, not only spatiality and global histories. Anne Kuttner, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I just um, I just typed it into the comments too. Um, I was fascinated, Shannon, with what you were showing because I love those screens. And one way I've often thought about them is the very mechanical sound of what they do and the way in which they are telling you about machines, about what are supposed to be regular machines, big, noisy, regular machines. I mean, there's sort of something about the correlative between those noises and what trains and planes do in a sense. And when they go wrong, we sort of worry viscerally those machines will fail also. I mean, does that? do anything for you? 
Absolutely. Yeah, this was the point that actually Ingra Safran, another Philadelphia person, mentioned in her her repeated articles about the removal and the the the, continue, the kind of the, the current fate of the split flap in 30th Street Station, how there's a, um, a kind of a rhyme, a rhythmic kind of consonance between the mechanical sounds of the train itself and the mechanical motion of the split flap. And just going back to Peter's comments earlier, I wrote a piece maybe two years ago now called Things That Beep that's about a history of product sound design, how everything from automobile designers to the people who design potato chip bags to the people who design like what Skype sounds like when you make a phone call or what certain kind of audio notifications, how they often are in a way to provide some type of sonic verification because we don't have the haptic verification that something has clicked or that the mechanism has happened or the message was sent. So because there are not those um, mechanical cues anymore to let you know that it's a job well done, you need some type of a digitally rendered sonic um, confirmation that you, you've done the job essentially. So there's a long, uh, interesting history of kind of especially digital product sound designers who are thinking about the, the, confirm the confirmation role of, of um, these skeuomorphic sounds. Other questions out there? People want to raise their hands. I see Danny has provided us with a nice split flap update sound if you want to <laughs> install it on your phone. Jerry. Thank everybody for really wonderful, wonderful presentations. You know, I have I have some random thoughts as, as often do. I mean, uh, I mean, an example Peter didn't give of of a holy language that's visually represented but is really nonsense is the way Hebrew is sometimes represented in in um, medieval or early modern painting clearly by artists who don't know Hebrew um, but but it's there as, as something holy. Um, some of the kind of ephemeral uses of printing on silk that I'm thinking of um, that we're so familiar with we probably um, cast them aside is is you know printing on ribbons award ribbons right where the text is is always on on fabric um and a a, a ceremonial one um the ketubah was mentioned but the you know the insides of yarmulkes at weddings and bar mitzvahs i'd right, always have printed on the fabric the um the occasion um but i i had um actually a, a, a question for Chris, which is really, I mean, I'm, I'm profoundly puzzled by, by the object um, as, as you, know, you are, um, but you, you, you spoke of it as a, a kind of pattern book, and yet it's a really crappy pattern book because it's not just that the text is, is, is garbled, but as you demonstrated, the, the images themselves are so much cruder than what you were showing as as, as being on the gemstones. So, um, you know, at some level that doesn't really make sense to me, but I, I'm, I'm sure it's an issue you've been wrestling with. Um, you know, a kind of wacky notion um, and, and, and tell me why, why this is just like totally stupid is, is perhaps it belongs to some crazy hypochondriac who wants as many, <laughs> you know, as many cures as possible on that one piece of metal as, as he or she possibly can get. I mean, do, do, do we have examples of kind of portmanteau amulets where, where more than one spell is being cast um, on, on a single object? And, and again, in this case, it's obviously not, a, it doesn't seem to be a, a high or refined object. It seems to be, you know, a kind of crude rendering of, of, of what you showed on the, the other amulets that you were, that you were showing to us. Yeah, well, Jerry, I, I don't think you can use the word crude for something, you know, so for the, the, the eighth or ninth century cu customer who goes into the shop and this is copied out on a papyrus or, or even a piece of paper at that point, um, it wouldn't, uh, they, they don't know what the gems look like because they, they've been out of circulation for 500 years. So I think what makes it powerful is the idea that there's a tradition and in fact, they, they don't understand what, what is on that, right? So that's, so that's part of it. The, one of the things that I didn't have a chance to mention is that in, in, uh, tr in transforming the images, there, there were two images that I didn't get to talk about that use 
much older Egyptian images, and they they uh, they they change any time. There's two two occasions where they could have depicted uh, um, a uh, a human being with a an anthropomorphic body with an animal head, as the Egyptians did, and they don't. So so there's a kind of a scruple about not not being too weird, not being too strange. So on the on the uh, the Greco-Roman gems, you often have a, a man with a lion, a radiant lion's head. That's a very powerful solar god. And on the, on uh, on this later uh, uh, version of it, uh, there's some scruple that you that you you, uh, you can show mixed animals, but you can't show human and animals mixed together. So, I mean, I, I really I, I wanted to present this because it's it's a very strange, it's an outlier. Uh, none of the images that appear on it uh, appear on amulets of that date. You know, we have we have many many bronze amulets. So, um, and that's not exactly right, but none of them appear in, in the exact same form. Uh, so, I, 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 when I first uh, went to see it in Paris, I was convinced that the Arabic inscription had been added later, and that they had, they had ground it down, ground down the thing, and, and put it. But it, it was it was clearly made all at the same time, so it's a it remains a mystery. I, I... Thank you. I have a question from um, Susan Garfinkel in the chat, asking if anyone wants to comment on ephemerality and text on objects, or or we could add its converse, kind of monumentality or durability, and text on objects. Um, interesting that Shannon's split flat example presents a case where the ephemerality of the object and the ephemerality of the text don't necessarily correspond compared to the amulet or the playing card. We might add silk too as compared to paper or parchment, which will have different different durability or ephemerality. Does do any of you want to comment on this um, this question of ephemerality when we think about writing on objects as opposed to manuscripts and books? Well, I'll just say something about the the gemstones. It's curious that they um, they survive when when the, when the rings or the pendant uh, casings that held them don't survive, uh, and because they they end up loose in archaeological digs and they wash up on beaches, um, we have thousands of them, and and we only have ar archaeological provenance for about thirty. So it's, it's it's just a strange. We have all this data, and you cannot pin it. Uh, so if you, if you look at museum catalogs, they always say the gems are second or third century, second to third century. Uh, there's no basis. There's no. Uh, there's not a lot of archaeological basis for that. We know that th there's none before the beginning of the second century, as far as we, as far as we can tell. Uh, and um, so in terms of, uh, uh, it's 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 weird thing that the that by inscribing it on a very hard material, these things that uh, uh, come through, and some some of them look as if they're brand new, right? Uh, but we don't actually know what age they came. We don't what 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 century they're sending the uh, the message from. It's a curious feature of these. Yeah, and the amulet you were showing us seems, as you were suggesting, seems almost like an attempt to preserve a whole variety of. If it is a kind of storehouse of different possible uh, pattern or like a pattern book, um, it's it's got a preservationist aspect to it as well to kind of um, keep them all together in one almost like a database on stone. Um, Peter, go ahead. Well, put your microphone on. Uh, I've got a question for you, Jennifer. I wondered if you could show again the in the um, account of the cards, what their values are. Because what struck me was that looking at Asia, the, um, sorry, America, America had Washington and, uh, well, it went, it went Washington, Canada, Mexico, or the court cards. And that corresponds to the highest PIP card. So that, that literally is 10, 9, 8. Um, but that's not the case when you look at above at clubs. Clubs is Africa and it goes Egypt, Algiers, Morocco. But then when you look at the places, 10 is Egypt, 9 is, was Barbary meant to, I guess Barbary is Algiers, just a difference of name. So I, I, perhaps I'm wrong. So it is Barbary, I presume means Algiers, does it? You see what I'm saying? This is the clubs. So number nine, 
if you go, it goes Egypt, Algiers, Morocco, our king, queen, knave, and then 1098 are Egypt, Barbary, Morocco. But Barbary, I presume, actually. So I, so I guess it is the same. Are, are you following me on this? I'm just wondering whether... Uh, yeah, that's a no. That, that's a good point. I, I do think it's. Um, I do think it is maybe intended to be um, to that Barbary here is is meant to kind of parallel Algiers. Um, right. But uh, but it is it is kind of curious to see again, kind of um, yeah, as you're kind of noting what what those hierarchies are, right? And um, yeah. and, um, and and how um, I, guess, I guess how fixed they're they're trying to keep it right because right. the same thing happens in the diamonds if you look at the diamonds it goes yes. china persia mysore <laughs> and then in the terms of the nations it's china persia hindustan right yeah yeah and those shifts of naming and it's sort of they seem odd yeah and, and i think the argument you know it's it's for um kind of the indian region um but it, but it actually brings up a good point, I think, um, you know, as I'm thinking about this too, about, uh, you know, even looking at these geographical playing cards and the way that they're kind of forming these hierarchies, um, you know, it also gives us a lot of information about, um, you know, the, the different terms that are being used for the different regions, right? And, um, and which kind of terms um, are kind of in use and uh, in, in ways that we might find problematic today or, you know, and, or, you know, what, what kinds of maybe distinctions that they're speaking to um, in the period. Peter, it's perfect, Peter, the uh, King Washington, the way that the king is Washington. <laughs> that's, for, that's for your New England primer uh, Absolutely. Uh, side there. And, and, and who, who is Niala? I'm furiously Googling Niala from Canada. I was like- I, I've done that what? as well. I'm not yet. What? If anybody finds, you know. <laughs> I, I can't, what? Yeah. I'm gonna figure out who, what the representation is supposed to be. Yeah, and who are who are the knaves? So Robespierre is obviously <laughs> the very opposite of an anti-royal um, with George the Fourth and and Catherine the Two, uh, the Second. So are the other knaves somehow subversive figures, or do we not know? I, I mean, I don't know who Hyder Ali Good or question, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robespierre is a very very strange person to have. <laughs> Exactly. No, but it makes sense for the knave. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're probably onto something that the knaves are all, it would be interesting to look into Telasco more oh, of literally, and whether they're all similarly subversive. Right, a particular kind of reputation. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have reached almost seven o'clock. So unless someone has a pressing final question or thought, I think we should all thank our four speakers. And uh, it was really um, exciting group of presentations with exciting overlaps between them. So thank you all. And if you are not on our um, listserv, you can sign up on our website. Um, we will be back next week with um, Thomas Conlon um, speaking about um, uh, the transmission of omission, understanding Japan's 14th to 15th centuries through altered histories. So we will um, learn about Japanese, um, Japanese printing uh, next week. So I hope you can come back and join us for that as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.